evening, Madison United Methodist Church, and welcome back to Soul Fuel. Uh, I'm sorry about the two-week break. Uh, illness got me both times. Uh, one was just kind of a cold sinus infection type thing, and the other one was a reaction to uh, the Johnson & Johnson uh, vaccination. I can say that I'm fully vaccinated and protected that way, but man, that one shot nailed me hard. Uh, I was down for about 48 hours from the, the side effects, but uh, well worth it. Uh, I've, got the, I've got the protection now. Um, we ended last time uh, in the chapter 11 uh, as we saw the seventh and final trumpet sound and the reaction from there. And we're picking up this week uh, in chapter 12, and we're going to go through the whole chapter and these two signs that are going to happen and just the amazing things um, that we see that can be confusing, but we're going to take a close look at these things and try to explain it. So Revelation chapter 12, there are five different parts throughout the whole thing. We're going to look at all of them and we're going to start with 12 verses 1 through 4. This is the English Standard Version and it says, And a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of twelve stars. She was pregnant and was crying out in birth pains in the agony of giving birth. And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon with seven heads and ten horns, and on his heads seven diadems. Diadems are crowns. His tail swept a third of the stars of heaven and cast them to earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth, so that when she bore her child, he might devour it. So, like I said, we start with these two signs that will begin to point us towards the end as it starts talking about things that have already happened. So, these signs symbolize the fulfillment of God's salvific plan in heaven and on earth through the birth of death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So the first sign we see is this woman, and her, her appearance is spectacular. It says she's clothed with the sun, which is, which is reminiscent of God wrapping himself with light as a garment, which we can find in Psalms, Psalms 104. And the moon is under her feet. Now, this can be understood a couple different ways. Uh, it's m most likely a sign of dominion or permanence. Uh, but it's also been understood over the years to be an allegory for, uh, you know, kind of a dominion over hypocrites or uh, what one author called evil Christians, which are people pretending to be Christians and doing harm, and, and, and those clinging to the old covenants. Uh, I think it really is just a symbol of dominion and presence. Now, a crown on her head uh, suggests victory, and recalls the crown of life that the faithful receive. So the 12 stars are thought to mean that either the 12 tribes of Judah, excuse me, the 12 tribes of Israel, or the 12 apostles. So the 12 tribes means Israel, or the 12 apostles, of course, meaning the church. I think it means both. It's showing that this is going to have uh, uh, consequences for both. And one being founding and one already existing. And the woman is pregnant and is suffering intensely. She cries out in pain. And this is often associated as a metaphor that is applied to Israel. Um, some related to persecution uh, suffered by the covenant community uh, in the time before the birth of the Messiah or just persecution in general that the church and, uh, the, the, and Israel has gone through throughout all time. And then, just when we think we can understand what's going on with this woman, we get introduced to the second character, and that's this, this dragon who's introduced as an adversary to the woman. Now, in the vision, the dragon is enormous, and dragons often serve as a symbol for evil in the Old Testament. Now, the word that we translate in Greek, which means dragon, in Hebrew is translated as Leviathan, which we see all over the place. Uh, Leviathan, I think most prominently known, comes from the book of Israel, where it talks about how Leviathan is swimming amongst the chaos uh, of the sea. And Leviathan is this 
this creature that is the complete and permanence of evil. And it, then in, in, Israel, in uh, Isaiah, it talks about how God, with this great and wicked sword of, of truth and righteousness and justice, will slay Leviathan and forever rid, rid the word of chaos and evil. So this, this same imagery that we see in Isaiah is translated into Greek as dragon, and we see once again an adversary uh, to God. So the dragon is clarified as Satan in verse, in verse 9. The color red in apocalyptic literature, especially Revelation, is a symbol for evil. I know I say that wearing red. Uh, that wasn't planned until I just kind of remembered that, but hey. Uh, the dragon has seven heads. It's a symbol for completeness talking about the universality of the dragon's power. In other words, what the dragon will do will have consequences for everybody. Um, and it's completely evil. So the crowns that this dragon bears are not symbols of victory or really a, a royalty. It's a false claim to authority and offense to the true king of kings. Uh, King of kings and Lord of lords, who, as we often see, wears many crowns uh, as not only in the book of Revelation, throughout all scripture. So there are ten horns on this dragon, and this is where it gets unique. You have to ask yourself, you know, does that mean some, some heads have more horns than the other or anything like that? And horns signify power, and I believe this is meant to inspire awe and create feelings of dread rather than to provide a what we might consider an understandable portrait of what this dragon looks like. And then we see the tail of the dragon sweeps away the third of the stars out of the sky. And this is understand as two ways. It's either a way of proclaiming the power that the dragon has, or it's showing that the power that the dragon has is limited, as in he would wipe away all the stars, but he, was only, he only had the authority to do a third. So we'll pick back up in verse 4, uh, and because our next section is going to pick back up with the last half of uh, uh, verse 4, so 4b. It says, uh, His tail swept down a third of the stars of heaven and cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman, woman who was about to give birth, so that when she bore her child, he might devour it. Devour it. She gave birth to a male child, one who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. But her child was caught up to God and to his throne. And the woman fled into the wilderness prepared by God, in which she is to be nourished for 1,260 days. So we move from cosmic views down to earthly views and then back to heavenly views. The, the, the camera is constantly moving in chapter 12. So a lot of people believe that what we see here as the, the, the dragon that is ready to devour the child as it is born is revealing to us the story just prior to Jesus' birth when King Herod, finding out about the Messiah's birth through the wise men, he decides to eliminate all children under a certain age. Uh, so the attempted destruction of the child Jesus. Now, the child is born, uh, Jesus Christ, of course, and it says we'll rule with an iron scepter. This emphasizes the judicial authority of the Messiah. Now, I know right now in the news, and I don't usually talk about the news and stuff like this, but there has been all this stuff about judging in the role of the Christian. And we can talk about what a Christian is and is not to do with judging. There is a role for that. It's called accountability within the, the Christian life. But there was a, a famous statement, and I'm not even going to say the name, that said that somebody needs to tell the church that God is not about judging. That's not true. Uh, literally, we see the child Jesus Christ receiving an iron scepter giving him a judicial authority. In other words, Christ will sit on the judgment throne. That's why the cross was necessary. There is a judgment. And to say anything different is a completely a false narrative spoken by a false prophet. There is a judgment, and Christ will serve in that, in that role. So 
Christ receives complete judicial authority as the Messiah. And and we will see soon as king. So the verb that we translate as rule. So when we get all worried about this, you know, uh, this, you know, Christ with an iron scepter who's going to judge us. We have to remember that this is seen through the lens of God and Christ's love for us. So the word that we translate as rule literally means to shepherd. And by an extension, rule with a sense of personal involvement. So we have a hard time understanding rule, especially as American Christians. (coughs) Excuse me. Because we've never seen rulers who had complete authority do anything good with it. You can, you know, that's one of the reasons we broke away uh, as we did. We've never seen rulers who have complete authority uh, do anything good. Ultimate power, com- you know, corrupts ultimately. What we see here, however, is God on the throne. Holy, loving God. And God doesn't rule as in do what I say or else. He rules as a shepherd who tends the flock and earnestly does what is best for them and desiring only for their well-being. That doesn't mean we get to pick the rules. God is king, after all. But the rules that he sets in place are literally for our betterment, as somebody who we can honestly say knows better than us. That can be hard to hear. And, it, it, you know, the American in us wants to say, well, nobody knows better than us than we do. But yeah, we really do. We are broken because of our sinful nature. We cannot honestly determine sometimes what is the best for us. That's why Christ came as this shepherding, loving person. And this is why God rules over us in this shepherding capacity so that we might receive the best. And it's not the best as in and so you get gruel in your little cage. It's the best when it talks about green pastures and rushing waters and the best of the best of the best for prosperity. So immediately after his birth, we, it's interesting, you know, in the, in the sign right after his birth, he's caught up to heaven. So right, it's, it, you get it all right there, birth, death, and as, resurrection and ascension like that. There's literally not even a comma. So it's interesting. And, you know, and as he's snatched up to God and his throne. So God is in this sign revealing that the birth, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ is, one of, is, is the singular event that will shape everything. And then we go back to the woman. So you would kind of see, I have no idea how this would work. The child is born and then suddenly he's snatched up to heaven. It's one of those prophetic images that you just go. But, you know, the camera moves back to the, the woman. It says the woman then flees to the desert, which some people see and interpret as uh, the flight to Egypt in order to save Christ from Herod. Um, that's very possible, but the desert is a, an apop, uh, apocalyptic, uh, apocalyptic theme, and it's traditionally understood as a place of refuge during times of trouble. The people of God flee to the desert, uh, you know, e- even in times of Christian persecution, there were people that fled to the desert. I- it's most likely a metaphor uh, rather than an actual place that God has prepared for her where she's going to be taken care of. In other words, that even in all the persecution, even in all the attacks, God has a place of protection for us, that we are protected in the midst of this attack. So you've got all this going on in center stage. And then depending on who you talk to and how it's understood, you either get a flashback or everything pans up to heaven. So this is either something that's already happened, according to Hebrew understanding, or something that will happen, according to some Christian traditions. I believe it's something that's already happened. And this picks up in verse 7 through 9. So you kind of get the narrative of the woman, and then we're going to get the narrative of the report of war in the heaven, and then it's going to go back to the woman. So it's almost kind of 
it's interesting. It's a story that just kind of plopped down in the middle of this. And it says, now war arose in heaven. This is verse 7. Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon. And the dragon and his angels fought back. But he was defeated, and there was no longer any place for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent who was called the devil, and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. So the narrative of the woman and the dragon, like I said, it's just it's, it's right in the middle of this. So the location is up in the heavenly realm. And it's interesting because Michael and his angels are waging war. But it's Michael that's leading the, ar- the uh, army in this instance, not the Messiah who's leading the army in this, in this instance. And that's not really explained. So that's what makes me think it's before. It's before the crucifixion and the resurrection. So the enemy is the seven-headed dragon and his angels. Now, remember, we're looking at a book that we consider Christian, but it's written in in Jewish understanding. And in Jewish understanding, Satan was an angel who sought equality with God. In other words, he thought he should be right up there with God, making all the same judgments. And he led a amount of angels with him and was thrown out of heaven alongside the angels that sided with him and thrown down to earth. So the dragon is not strong enough and loses his place in heaven. That's why for, for in some of Jewish literature, you see Satan up in heaven talking with God. Job is the most uh, well-known instance where you've literally got God and Satan talking back and forth. He's just known as the accuser. And then later, Satan is down here causing problems. So verse 9 opens and closes with the banishing of the dragon, the removal of Satan from heaven. So at some point in time, this battle happens and Satan is kicked out. Of course, the dragon is linked to the ancient serpent uh, and back to the deceiving of Eve and Adam uh, and then labeled as Satan. But all this is thrown down to earth which is why we have spiritual battles now, because, this, because the Satan, the deceiver, knows he's operating on a limited time base. Now, I'm getting ahead of myself. So what follows after this is a song of victory. Picking up at verse 10, it says, And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down, who accuses them day and night before our God. And they have conquered him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. For they love not their lives even unto death. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. But woe to you, O earth and sea, for the devil has come down to you in great wrath, because he knows his time is at short. So it opens with another loud voice. Somebody has the job of narrator in heaven. And I love that. It's a celestial victory cry. And it's also that same words that of the white-robed multitude who were delivered from persecution. The establishment of God's sovereign, sovereign reign is now made possible because of the expulsion of the accuser. Satan was causing problems before that. The basis of the saint's victory over the accuser is Christ's death and resurrection, having been, been resu- uh, represented in this cosmic war but now the devil has purpose and that is to destroy all those who believe because he know he has a short amount of time left in other words he knows that the day is coming and will christ will redeem the world all evil will be removed and justice and righteousness will roll like waters and at that time he knows he loses so his main concern is is to destroy and take as many people with him as possible. That's going on right now. Satan is doing his best to accuse and deceive and tempt to pull people away from God so that he can destroy the believers. And we pick back up in verse 13. And it says, And when the dragon saw that he had been thrown down to earth, he pursued the woman who had given birth to the male child. But the woman was given the two wings of the great eagle so that she might fly from the serpent into the wilderness to the place where she is to be nourished for a time and times and a half a time 
The serpent poured water like a river out of his mouth after the woman to sweep her away with a flood. But the earth came to help of the woman, and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed the river that the dragon had poured out from his mouth. Then the dragon became furious with the woman and went off to make war on the rest of her offspring, on those who keep the commandments of God and, hope and hold to the testimony of Jesus. And he stood on the sand of the sea. So for the fifth time, we see the devil being thrown down. This, the setting is now on earth, and he seeks the one who birthed the child. She's given wings like an eagle to escape, and that escape is provided by God. She is once again in a place prepared for her and taken care of by God. This reference is to persecution, though the idea that there is a, a time limit to how long this persecution will last. God's protection is shown in the final con confrontation between the serpent and the woman. Out of his mouth spew all of these waters that are meant to overtake the woman and sweep, and sweep her away. In the Old Testament, floods represent three things. Military conquest, divine judgment, and persecution on God's people. All of these things are represented in what the dragon, Satan, is doing to the woman. It's persecution coming after the, the church. It's persecution coming after the believers, those who hold to God's commandments, the people who hold the testimony of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Having failed to conquer the church, the authority of the church, Satan turns his eyes on the individuals, those who hold the testimony of Jesus Christ. We see this happening right now. God, you know, the devil is out there tempting people. He whispers temptations and accusations at the people of God, trying to pull them away. But the devil is a defeated foe. He cannot make you do anything. He can only whisper. He can only tempt. He can only accuse. And all those things are washed away in the power of the Holy Spirit. And the devil will run in terror at the spoken name of Jesus Christ, because at the hands of Jesus Christ, he was forever defeated. And this is the closing of the 12th chapter as the devil stands on the beach looking out to the ocean. And we will pick up next week as we go into chapter 13. I love teaching through the book of Revelation. I hope you're enjoying this. Uh, would you pray with me? Lord, I just pray your blessing as we study this book. I pray your blessing upon all that hear it. I pray, pray, Heavenly Father, that you take all that we have said and done that glorifies you, that you would write it upon our hearts, that we might take it with us, Lord. That wherever we go, school, work, Kroger's, wherever it is, Lord, we might have it, that we can bless others with it. Use us, O Lord. Fill us, not just to the brim, but into the overflow. That in that overflow, anybody that gets near us is splashed by it. Thank you, Heavenly Father. And I just lift all this up. In Jesus' name, and amen. God bless you, church.